Okay, so today we're going to talk about a brief history of avatars and virtual characters. And uh, you'll see I've got a screenshot there from uh, uh, Second Life uh, and a screenshot from the recent Matrix Awakens game uh, where the avatars were pretty sophisticated uh, using uh, the epic Unreal Engine. So it, as we think about the landscape for this module in the class, uh, you know, I put these two together for a reason, avatars and virtual characters. And uh, it's because there's a continuum that we need to think about when, when we uh, think about uh, residents of the metaverse, uh, residents of video games. So uh, on either side of the continuum, we have avatars, uh, which are, of course, representing the player. Here we have a picture of uh, Laura Croft from uh, Tomb Raider. And on the opposite side, we have the AI avatars, which I like to call avies for short which uh, fall in the category of NPCs or non-player characters, uh, but really are, are characters just within the computer. And somewhere in the middle, we have this thing called virtual influencers, which is a trend that has gotten really big over the past, I don't know, five, six years or so. And it usually involves some element of AI and also some element of deception where people think that it's AI, but it's really controlled by humans. And you can see here how avatars and virtual influencers are controlled by humans whereas the virtual influencers and AI avatars are controlled by AI. There's also uh, another uh, part of the landscape that cuts between humans and AI, and this is uh, for the far future, so we won't cover it so much in this module, but uh, in, in later modules in the class, which is uploaded humans, right? which is when you take uh, all of the information in a human brain and then you upload it to uh, a uh, virtual environment, and then it's run by AI from that point forward, uh, as was um, uh, dramatized in some recent uh, science fiction, like the show Upload, etc. cetera. Um, so let's start with the definition of an avatar. If you look it up in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, you'll see that there's a few different definitions, and I've put them in a certain order here, which is not necessarily the order they're in. But the original uh, term avatar comes from Hinduism, and it means the incarnation of a Hindu deity, such as Vishnu. So the term avatara, the Sanskrit word, actually means to descend. There's also uh, an incarnation in human form, like you know, a person is an embodiment or a, an avatar of charity, for example. There's also uh, uh, a way to personify a basic entity, like latest avatar of the conservative movement. And then finally, we get to the definition that is most relevant for video games and for the metaverse, which is an electronic image that represents and may be manipulated by a computer user, as in a game. That's actually a pretty good definition, particularly since it says not just that it represents, but it may or may not be manipulated, which means it could be uh, AI or it could be completely under the control of the character. Uh, now, if you look up the definition or the um, uh, the page for virtual character on Wikipedia, you end up getting a lot of different terms. And that's because there's a lot of confusion about what a virtual character is, uh, what a virtual influencer is. You see some of the, uh, the different terms that you get pointed to by Wikipedia here. Uh, game character, embodied agent, interactive online characters, virtual friend virtual humans, which is a term that's popular, a virtual YouTuber or a VTuber. And so all of these things fall you know, within the realm of what we're talking about here. Uh, there's a pretty good definition in, uh, uh, in a paper of talking virtual characters. Uh, and that's that they are graphical simulations of real or imaginary persons capable of human-like behavior, most importantly, talking and gesturing. Uh, and then there's a little bit about AI techniques, uh, and how this represents the ultimate abstraction of the human computer interface, which basically is saying that once we get full AI or AGI within uh, the virtual world, uh, that will be the eventual best interface for um, uh, humans to work with computers, which is why sometimes you know, the metaverse is referred to uh, as the next generation of the internet. And if we eventually get AI residents of the metaverse, uh, we will have the ultimate uh, user interface as well. Now, there's a bunch of other terms or concepts that are relevant uh, in this schema. And we'll be talking about some of these as we go, and we'll look at the historical examples of where these came from. Uh, NPC stands for non-player character. 
which is any character that is not controlled by a player inside a video game. There's also that you may have heard the term CPU characters, which are controlled by the computer. So what's the difference between CPU and NPC? Well, it's more of a historical term, particularly like if you're playing uh, chess against the computer uh, and the computer is controlling uh, the opponent, that's often, it was referred to as CPU control. Um, but these days we use the term NPC fairly generically. There's also ACC or actor controlled characters. We'll talk about that. Uh, there's a term called embodied AI, which is a, another term for characters in the metaverse, digital humans uh, versus virtual humans, and then AI avatar, which I mentioned earlier. So before we jump into the history, uh, I'd like to take a quick look at the technology. Now, in this class, we're not really going to go too heavily into the technology, uh, but uh, you know, you'll see that early video games use these you know, very small 8-bit uh, bitmap images, raster images, and each of them represents a frame, and they use sprite-like animation techniques for animating avatars. And you know, this is called a sprite map on the left, which are each of the individual frames. Uh, and then on the right, you can see it uh, assembled into a GIF. And that's really how, how animation was done in the early days. And even today, you know, GIFs are very much just collections of frames. Uh, movies are collections of frames. That's what the motion pictures uh, refers to. Um, so really, the technique for animation is still that. Uh, but you know, we've upgraded a little bit from this, this very simple uh, 2D perspective. Uh, and in the 1990s, you started to see games uh, start to use 3D techniques, but the computers weren't always powerful enough to do real-time rendering from different virtual cameras and viewpoints. And so you got these 2.5D games, and it went all the way into the early 2000s with The Sims. Uh, on the left there, you see Ultima uh, 4, I think it is. Uh, and the idea with 2.5D is you're actually using 3D technology uh, to lay out the whole world, and then you choose a fixed perspective, and you show everything from that perspective. So it's not really full 3D, but you actually do develop the models. Now, when we talk about full 3D, um, let's go uh, here. Uh, the way that that generally works these days is that you have a mesh of the character uh, and uh, that mesh, here's a definition, which is a pool of vertices and edges to define a 3D object shape. Uh, you can see it here. Um, you can see very much uh, that the number of polygons, the polygon count, uh, will determine how good your model is. And eventually it goes through a number of steps uh, to become a fully baked and fully rendered character on your screen. Um, here's a, you know, a depiction of a, a character that has been blocked and sculpted. And you go through all these different layers, finally to texturing. Uh, and then once you've got a fully rendered character, there's also 3D techniques for uh, animating that character. And you can see, which is often uh, you know, referred to uh, partly as rigging and, and with animation. And the, the idea is that you've got these points that represent the shape. And turns out this technique is used you know, not just in video games, but with motion capture for movies also. Um, so again, we're not gonna go too heavy into the tech uh, these days, but it's a good idea to have at least some basic understanding you know, of this process. Okay, so with that background, let's jump right in and take a look at a brief history of avatars and virtual characters. So our journey begins all the way back in 1966 when a researcher at the MIT Media Lab named Joseph Weizenbaum created a program called ELISA which was uh, the first digital psychiatrist, but it was also the first chatbot. And Eliza was a clever program. It would take patterns of text using just a rule-based um, methodology. And it would, based upon what you said, it would take some of those words and fit them into the patterns. And so it almost seemed like you were having a conversation uh, with an actual person. Uh, like here, you can look at uh, this example. Is something troubling you? Men are all alike. What is the connection, do you suppose? They're always bugging us. Can you think of a specific example? 
Uh, you can see it with my boyfriend made me come here. You can see how the word boyfriend, uh, your boyfriend is used in the next sentence. Of course, it it's, you know gets pretty obvious pretty quickly that you're talking to a computer and not to an actual person who understands what you're saying. But still, this was uh, a pretty important moment uh, as we look at AI uh, within the computer. Now, in 1972, uh, another uh, uh, individual named Kenneth Colby created Perry, which was another chatbot. But rather than being a digital psychiatrist, uh, its personality was based uh, on a paranoid schizophrenic. And so that made for some lively uh, uh, textual chatting. And at one point, uh, they uh, put the two together, the digital psychiatrist and, and, and the paranoid uh, chatbot, and had made for uh, some very interesting conversations as well. You can still find records of that. And I think you can even uh, run it online. Uh, there's plenty of these online. So let's jump forward to, to 1973 uh, when the game Maze War was created. And this was really the first uh, graphical representation of a player in a multiplayer game. Uh, it wasn't the first video game. And we talked about Space War uh, from 1961 in the previous lecture, which also was a multiplayer game, except that was all on the same computer. And so, you know, Maze War was actually written by three high school students uh, in Mountain View, California, at the NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, and it could be used to uh, network two computers together, and you could actually really play against someone on another computer. Uh, and you'll notice the little representations here. Uh, they are uh, the other characters. So even though there's no graphical representation, I mean, you're just using ASCII characters. I mean, this was also the first first-person shooter. Right. And so the 3D perspective with these green lines actually was there. So there was quite a bit. Uh, the, the three uh, creators you know, went on, interesting enough, to go to MIT, Stanford, and Caltech. And uh, one of them created an eight computer version. Uh, and so you know, Maze War is pointed at by historians as being the first example of an avatar, even though they didn't use the term avatar. Now, the first actual graphical representation of a player was probably Taito's Basketball, which came out in 1974. And you can see here that it's a very simple representation. There's not even any uh, sprite animation like we talked about. It's just uh, a basic bitmap, if you will, of the character. But uh, again, we, we don't have the term avatar, but we do have a, a human representation. Now in 1970s, around 74 or 75, the term NPC actually uh, came into play. And it came into play not with computer games, but uh, with the tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and & Dragons. Uh, and so in these traditional games, you had a dungeon master. Now you can see the screenshot here of um, uh, from Stranger Things. Uh, and uh, the dungeon master in this case, you know, has the, uh, uh, the little barrier there. And uh, so any character that's controlled by the dungeon master and not controlled by the individual players was called an NPC, and, and so that is the origin of that term. Uh, from 75 to 84, we had lots of different graphical representations, primarily in single player games. You can see Pac-Man, Pac you can see Mario, who uh, perhaps is one of the, the first real actual personalities or characters who came out in the game Donkey Kong. You can see it there. Uh, but sometimes the representations were really simple. Uh, at the top here, we have Atari, adventure and uh, the, the character was really represented by that dot even though we have a dragon there and a key uh you know wasn't a very good representation uh, and in 1984 we really saw uh an improvement with the game king's quest uh which uh, uh where they actually had a character with animation moving around a, a graphical uh world uh, in an adventure game and so it was taking this idea from these role-playing text games of this uh, wide environment, and it was overlaying anim animation, simple sprite-based animation uh, on top of that. But that was pretty novel because back then either you had uh, you know, really fast graphics in arcade style games, or you had adventure style games where, which were either text or they were static images like of the castle here. Uh, and so that was a, a pretty big step forward, but it was still pretty much just a single player game at, at the time. Now in 83 and 84, we started to see the merger of video game 
and TV film techniques. Now, of course, animation had been around for many years, going back to Walt Disney and Mickey Mouse and uh, all of those, and there was animatronics. But uh, the first game that where you really saw these techniques from TV and film being brought into a video game was Dragon's Lair. And actually, it was an ex-Disney animator named Don Bluth uh, who actually created all of these animations. And so, you know, Dragon's Lair was unique because it was more like a game with actual like cartoon animation. And these took up so much room that you actually needed this giant laser disc in the arcade. Uh, speaking of Stranger Things, if, if you've seen the latest season, there's a, a scene where they're trying to play Dragon's Lair. And, uh, you know, not only were the graphics great, but you actually, actually had little cutscenes uh, where you weren't really controlling the character, but you were watching what happened. And it became known as one of the most difficult games uh, to play. All right. So from there, there was another game that came out uh, in 1984 called Karateka. And this was the first game that used rotoscoping. Uh, and again, this is a technique that had been used in animation. And so the creator of uh, this game, he actually filmed, uh, his name was uh, Jordan Mechner, and he actually filmed his karate instructor <laughs> doing the moves. And then he traced over the physical film, and then he used that to inform the animations. And you'll see that the animations for the characters uh, look a lot better in this than in a lot of other uh, you know, computer games of that era. Um, and, and so that was kind of an interesting step forward. Still, these techniques were used more in film and computer graphics were considered something completely different. In fact, it was 1982 that we had the first real computer sequence in a movie, which was Star Trek II, uh, The Wrath of Khan. Um, in 1985, the game Ultima IV came out and Ultima was a series of role-playing games, starting with one and uh, you know continuing on to Ultima Online and many others. But this game was perhaps the first time that the term avatar was used uh, in the video game to represent the character. Um, and the creator of Ultima was a guy named Richard Garriott, who was known as Lord British uh, in that world. Um, he actually you know, was looking to create a game which was not based on violence. And so he was doing a lot of research into Hindu texts and he saw that term avatar and which was the manifestation of a God, as he says in this quote here. And he wanted to, to have a term like that, but again, it wasn't necessarily representing the player. It was what you were trying to become, but, but really that was the, you know, the, the first popular use. There was another game called avatar from the seventies, uh, but you know, that, that wasn't that well known. Here's a, uh, a screenshot from Ultima 4. Uh, another aspect of Ultima 4 that was quite interesting was that it was, uh, although NPCs existed, remember this was still, we're still talking single player games uh, and they were really simple and you could perhaps talk to them, but they were so repetitive that there really wasn't much of a, a point. They weren't even as good as Eliza in terms of the conversations. And in Ultima 4, this was the first game where uh, the NPCs use what's called a dialogue tree. So you could actually have conversations and that would branch out. And that became a mainstay of more sophisticated adventure games in the years and decades to follow, including the Telltale games, which came out in the 2000s and uh, 20 teens, which uh, included like the Game of Thrones and the Walking Dead game. Uh, but the, those branch dialogue trees had their uh, origins here as well. Also in 1985, we had the first computer generated character. Uh, and you'll see there's a quote here from an article that says Max was advertised as computer generated and some believe this to be true. You may have seen Max Sundrum pictures and you know he had these kind of weird staccato type movements. Uh, and in the actual show, this was a show in Britain, uh, you know, the, the uh, character was played by an actor named Matt Frewer uh, who, died and then they were able to use his computer generated version uh, as a, uh, a newscaster. Now, this is the beginning of a long tradition that you'll see as we go through the history of virtual characters of uh, people thinking that something is AI or computer generated when it's actually not. In this case, this is actually the actor, Matt Brewer, uh, with some prosthetic makeup and some contact lenses on. And so they've kind of fiddled with it to make it look as if it's 
not human or real. Uh, sort of the opposite of what we've been trying to do over the last decade or two, which is uh, make more realistic uh, computer generated characters. Uh, there's a long tradition of taking uh, a character that is actually a human or that is completely controlled by a human or acted by a human and trying to make it look as if it's computer controlled. And you'll see many instances of that, you know, going, continuing to this day in, in 2022 at, at South by Southwest, for example, where there was a virtual character named Zero. And uh, he was pretty sophisticated. He was having great conversations, almost too good to be true. And it was too good to be true. It was actually uh, a voice actor that was uh, vocalizing that specific character. And then in 1986, we, we get to the end of this phase uh, with the game Habitat, uh, which was really the first proto metaverse. Uh, it was the first uh, multiplayer graphical game that really uh, had any traction. It was built uh, on the Commodore 64 by Lucasfilm. And there were a number of things related to avatars that this game pioneered, which is why it is actually interesting and uh, you know to look at this really first version of a metaverse, even though we don't have the term metaverse. Uh, yet, uh, this was really the first time that the term avatar uh, was used in the way that we use it today. Uh, so before we talk about Habitat, I, I think it's worth looking at this promotional video from Lucasfilm um, uh, about Habitat from 1986 and pay close attention uh, to the way they're describing this because nobody had heard the term avatar. They didn't really understand what it meant to control a character inside a game. And so uh, a lot of the promotional video, uh, at least the part that I'm going to show you, seems um, to be tailored towards making people understand what it means to be in a multiplayer virtual world. <laughs> Five cents, Pops. The name's not Pops. I just want to find out about this here parallel world. Uh, it's called Habitat, but cough up that dope, Pops. No playing games. Jimmy, the name's not Pops. Look, I promise I'll pay you as sure as my name is. Valentino. Valentino? What's going on here? What kind of game are you playing, Pops? Pops and his friend Jimmy aren't the first people to get drawn into this strange new world where names can change as quickly as events. Surprises lurk at every turn, and the keynotes of existence fantasy and fun here in a place called Habitat. What's a uh, teleport boot? <laughs> Where am I? And who in the heck are you? It is said that boredom once ruled the lifestyles of the avatars, the beings who populate this world. But recently, all that changed. With the birth of an alliance between powerful beings, both here in Habitat and in the human realm, and with the cooperation of a huge mainframe computer in Virginia. Now, using their modems and Commodore computers, people from Westport to Walla Walla can join Quantum Link and Lucasfilm on an electronic journey unlike any other. One that leads to Habitat, where thousands of avatars, each controlled by a different human, can converge to shape an imaginary society. Hey, listen, my real name's Henry. Uh, they call me Pops. I, I mean... No, thick wit. Henry's your human. He's just controlling you. Here you get to be someone else. Well, th th then I, I guess I really am Valentino. Talk about great expectations, lover boy. Now let me be a minute. I got some digging to do and some treasure to find. All right, so there you have a flavor for this video and the, the full video, uh, the link to the full video is available in the course materials. Uh, but you'll see that they, they really uh, were trying to get this idea across that's pretty common today about the human and the avatar. And there's plenty of videos uh, and screenshots of, of Habitat you can find online. Uh, and there's actually a, a, a resurrected version of Habitat online 
that you can play. And and there had to be a change in copyright laws because uh, you know the game had been abandoned long ago. Lucasfilm created LucasArts. But let, let's talk a little bit about the significance of Habitat. Um, I mean, I've talked about it as the first metaverse, but let's talk about it from the perspective of, of avatars. Now, as I mentioned, it was uh, created at Lucasfilm, which eventually created a, uh, a group called Lucasfilm Games, which became LucasArts. Um, and uh, uh, the, it was the first game to really use the term avatar. Uh, you can see a little screenshot there where the avatars were customized. It was created by um, a group that included uh, Randy Farmer and Chip Morningstar. And they've you know talked a bit about their experience in creating this game because it's become part of video game history. Here's a quote from uh, from Randy Farmer. Uh, I think this was in the the nineties uh, uh, when when this specific uh, uh, you know when this specific uh, quote occurred. But he talked about Chip came up with the word avatar because back then pre internet you had to call a number with your telephone, set it in the cradle. We had that sound which you heard in the previous uh, lecture. Uh, but really, they were trying to get across this idea that you are the puppet master controlling the puppet. And instead of using strings, you were using this telephone line. And so that's really you know, what, why they decided to call it an avatar. Now, the term would become popularized later uh, in the 90s with Snow Crash. But let's look at some of the important innovations here. So first of all, you could customize your avatar, right? I mean, we saw in the video, by the way, uh, the voices were just for the promo video. <laughs> uh, the game did not have voice chat at that point in time. Uh, that would have been uh, pretty difficult to do. Uh, it used primarily text uh, as the interface, um, uh, the communication mechanism. And so you'll see here that you've got a player and the head of a player, and you can change the sex, you can change the height, you can change the hair, you can change the torso. So there was a level of customization, even with these you know, very primitive 2D you know, sprite-based graphics, you could also you know, pick up objects. And so you'd see a gun uh, that would be attached uh, to the animation. Uh, and so for its time, and this was actually quite ahead of its time, it also had what's called ghost mode. Uh, and that was because there was a limit to how many avatars you could have in any one scene. I, I forget the number, maybe it was six, but, uh, you know, they had theaters inside uh, the world. And so you could go to ghost mode, in which case your avatar turned into this, uh, this eye of Horus icon, and you can see it here. And so you could be in the room. Uh, and that's kind of uh, you know an interesting innovation, uh, but it was really like many innovations in video games uh, and in the world of computers, it was driven by constraints. And the fact that everything was so slow, you're talking about like a 2400 baud modem, I think, uh, or somewhere in that range. Uh, that was sending information over the wire. Uh, and so much of what they did uh, and much of what programmers in the 80s had to do was very much about uh, getting around those limitations. They also had the first you know, friends chat in a multiplayer graphical game. Of course, there were multi-user dungeons before that, but there was this thing called ESP. And so that was a way that you could chat and send a message to someone uh, and that only that person would get. So when you're in a multiplayer environment, you have to think about who can hear what. And normally every time somebody said something, they typed it in, everyone saw it, but not with the ESP. Habitat also was the first place you started to see this, uh, this trade-off and, and, and this will play into the history of the metaverse and virtual worlds where, you know, most, uh, Video games were games. They were RPGs or arcade games, and you had a specific objective. Uh, but virtual worlds and metaverses are more social spaces where you can interact with other people. And so uh, even going all the way forward to Ready Player One, for those of you who are reading that or have seen the movie, you'll know that, you'll know that there was this kind of trade-off between uh, playing the game and being social and all the way, moving all the way forward to today, uh, you're seeing the same uh, that same tension in Fortnite, which started off, you know, as a battle royale game, but now has become as much a, a social mechanism. And so uh, within Habitat, there were hit points. You could actually fight and do like a, a role playing game, but you could also just socialize and talk to people. Uh, each character avatar had its home turf. There was even this idea or a concept of a marriage. I don't think they called it that, but you could merge two players turfs. Uh, and so, you know, that was just yet another example of uh, the fact that this was 
more, more about socializing. Uh, you could also have nonverbal communication uh, between players by you can use function keys to make gestures. I'd say so the, the animations were a little more sophisticated uh, than what had come before. They also had the first griefers uh, that were, you know, once you start to get any group of multiple people online, you know, you're going to have some people that cause trouble. And they saw this all the way back in the late 80s. They also had their first uh, newspaper um, called the Weekly Rant, which was, uh, you know, had a number of things that had been going on within this virtual world. And so this is perhaps one of the first times that a graphical world can be thought of as having an existence independent of you being logged in, right? There are things going on all the time. Like, uh, like I said, there were weddings, there were, you know, all kinds of social events. Uh, there were theaters, uh, people doing role playing, et cetera. So, uh, so ha Habitat had a, a lot of uh, innovations that to this day are impacting, you know, what we call the metaverse. Now, if you're curious what it was like to actually run a video game company in this era, uh, there's a TV show called Halt and Catch Fire. Uh, and the first season was uh, took place in the early 80s and was more about uh, making physical computers. But the second and third seasons, uh, they, uh, they're located in Dallas and they're actually running a video game company, kind of like Habitat, where they're using modems uh, to do run a bulletin board and they have the video game and eventually they relocate to Silicon Valley. And, and, and I can tell you, you know, I ran a video game company decades later in 2010 during the mobile revolution. And, uh, you know, a lot of what they depict were things that we were going through even decades later. So if you're curious about, you know, the entrepreneurial side uh, of, of running a game company in that period or any other kind of period, I recommend uh, watching uh, the second and perhaps third season uh, of Halt and Catch Fire. 